I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Genevieve Devine is a fisheries technician with the Aquatic Invasive Species Program at the Division of Aquatic Resources. So Jen, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so like Kim said, my name is Jen Devine um, and I am a fisheries technician with the Division of Aquatic Resources. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, some algae um, and how you guys can help us with some of our projects um, using a program called iNaturalist. So let's first start out um, with explaining the Division of Aquatic Resources and what we kind of aim to do. Um, so when we say aquatic resources, what exactly are we talking about? So aquatic meaning anything that has to do with a water. So fresh water, brackish water, salt water, um, DAR kind of helps to manage it all. And resources, um, things that people utilize. Um, so aquatic resources would be things that people utilize in the water space. So a couple common things that most people think of when we're talking about aquatic resources is maybe surfing, fishing, um, snorkeling or scuba diving, and then maybe sometimes the industries that are related to this. Um, but then you also have the um, aquatic environment as a whole in providing ecological significance and importance. And the cool thing about looking at the ecological importance of the aquatic environment is that if we keep it healthy, it will help keep all of the other resources in the ocean that people utilize healthy as well. And there are a lot of things that threaten this. Um, and one of the major ones is invasive species, which is why we're all here talking about invasive species for the month of February in Hawaii. So let's first talk about what classifies an organism as an invasive. So there's a couple terms that we hear when talking about invasives. Um, and the first is cryptogenic. So this means that, um, say a species was found in Honolulu Harbor, and we're not sure if it's supposed to be in Hawaii or if it's um, generally supposed to be somewhere else. Um, so this is, we're uncertain of where its origin is. And then if we take it one step further, and we can classify things as non-native. This is when we were able to uh, know that a species is not from Hawaii and that it's originally located from somewhere else. And then um, further classifying it as invasive means that it's causing harm to the aquatic environment. So it's not located where it's supposed to be, but it's also causing harm. So aquatic invasive species commonly have um, shared characteristics, and some of them are that they have a high reproductive rate, which means that they're able to reproduce quickly and kind of spread quickly. Um, they have no or low predation, and this means that nothing is really feeding on this organism or um, causing the numbers to kind of go down, so they're just proliferating and becoming dominant in that area. Um, most of the invasive species also have high dispersal, which means that they're able to cover a large area. Um, and they also have high adaptability. So um, some common invasive species are maybe found in just freshwater or just brackish water or just salt water, but they're able to adapt and invade new areas where they're not commonly found. And um, most commonly, um, aquatic invasive species are able to take over a niche environment and outcompete the native species that are commonly found there. And that's kind of what makes them so dangerous. So we're here for HESOM, um, Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month, and we're kind of making a big hype about all of these invasive species. And um, one might think, is this a bit alarmist? But in fact, we're not being alarmist at all. And actually in a 2014 Davidson study, uh, we found that th there were 346 non-indigenous marine algae and invertebrate species found in Hawaii alone. Um, so that means that we have almost the same number as the entire continental US 
um, which is super high if you think about the coastline area of the continental U.S. compared to just the coastline of our state. Um, that's a huge number to try to manage for one state instead of, you know, the states that have coastal areas where they're trying to just manage their one small area with a few invasives. So where are these invasive species coming from? Uh, this is a graph also by the Davidson paper produced in 2014. Um, you can see along the x-axis that um, most species come from vessel fouling vectors as opposed to not vessel fouling vectors. Um, and you can see the number of species on the y-axis that are introduced by each vector. And then the vessel fouling vectors can be broken down even further. And um, you can see here that the two main vessel fouling vectors are uh, ballast water and biofouling. So ballast water being that internal water that ships carry for stability. And then biofouling, that external um, organisms that attach to the hull of the ships. Um, and if you guys are interested more in learning about these vessel factors. Um, there is a presentation that I'll plug at the end of my presentation by um, a fellow colleague at DAR. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, but as seen in this graph, we also have non-fouling vectors. And most commonly, um, those refer to either aquaculture or aquarium trade, either intentional or non-intentional releases. Um, but you can see that those don't number nearly as high as the vessel fouling vectors. So like I said, invasive species cause harm to the environment. Um, and because Hawaii has such a unique ecosystem, there are some harmful effects that are unique and some that aren't unique to our area. So the first um, is human health impacts that are caused by invasive species. So invaders can be poisonous, venomous, or stinging, and that's obviously a huge concern. Um, especially in a place like Hawaii, where a lot of people utilize the ocean. Um, Hawaii also has a high endemic population, which means uh, populations that are only found here on the islands. And that means that if an invader does possibly come in, it can take over a niche that maybe is only occupied by a species found here, putting it at high risk um, for maybe not existing anymore because there's no backup species anywhere else. And the diversity also holds a lot of environmental and cultural significance. And the healthy near shore reefs help support a healthy Hawaiian economy. So our tourism, aquaculture, and fisheries industries are responsible for about $4 billion in gross revenue per, per year, which is a huge benefit. And a lot of people's jobs rely on healthy reefs. So that is why we have a team of people that is dedicated to managing these aquatic invasives that threaten our healthy ecosystem. So our team consists of six full-time staff um, that are responsible for managing the all the Hawaiian Islands um, aquatic invasive species. So that's a lot of area to cover for just six people. So we try to take a three-pronged approach with how we try to look at these aquatic invasives. We have pre-border, border, and post-border approaches. So pre-border is trying to manage these species before they get here. So that includes things like regulating that ballast water and biofouling that I was talking about um, to try to limit the amount of species being brought in, uh, regulating aquatic imports for fisheries and aquaculture, and um, identifying possible high-risk species that could be brought in for other reasons. And then at the border, we look at trying to increase the ability for early detection and rapid response. So species that enter Hawaii, before they become established, we can try to manage them so that they don't spread prolifically, like we know that invasive species are apt to do. And unfortunately, if these species do come in and do establish, we have post-border management, um, where we attempt to minimize the negative effects of these invasive species by monitoring, controlling, and managing um, these areas. 
And so oftentimes um, we target invasive algae. And there's a couple of reasons why we look mainly at invasive algae um, in particular. Um, the first reason is because invasive algae is able to quickly overgrow native corals. The average coral growth rate in Hawaii is about two centimeters a year. So if you imagine um, algae, which is a plant, um, can grow a lot quicker than that. Um, and you'll see in some later slides that a lot of the invasive algae can create thick mats that shield the coral from the sunlight, which um, can smother it. So um, it's important for us to try to target um, these species that can cover up our native and endemic corals. Invasive algae is also sessile, um, meaning it's not moving. So it's e easier for us to go out and uh, monitor and figure out where it is if it's not moving around. Um, we also have proven management tools, which I'll also touch upon um, in later slides and will also be spoken about in a later PowerPoint by um, some other DAR colleagues that I'll plug their talk at the end of my talk as well. Um, but because we have these proven ways to manage these areas, um, it's a good use of our resources to try to manage these areas. And then the fourth reason is because most manageable areas are easily identified, mapped, and then we can most confidently utilize our resources for these targeted areas. Um, so we target five main species of algae. Um, and actually this first one I'll talk about is a species complex. So it's more than one species. Um, and this is smothering seaweed. So some identifiers are um, that it's a prickly, um, thick type algae that has spiny branches. And you can see um, in these pictures, the left is the capophycus, and that seems to grow um, kind of in a little bit more thick and green branches, whereas the um, eukema is a little bit more prickly, in my opinion, and tends to grow in a little bit thinner branches. But you can see um, both create this smothering mat where um, you can kind of see in the background of the right photo, it's starting to smother some of that coral that was growing in the area first. Um, and an interesting thing about the smothering seaweed is that it's only found on Oahu's windward coast. So like I was saying before, um, we do try to target areas of algae that can be managed efficiently. Um, so by containing this algae, in the area that it exists, we're hoping to decrease the likelihood that it will spread to other parts of Oahu. The second algae that we target is Gorilla Ogo. So you can see in this right photo, it also creates these mats that kind of overgrow this coral um, that you can see in the left portion of the rightmost photo. Um, and it typically has this orangey color to it. Um, it can be somewhat brown sometimes, um, but it's most identifying feature is that it has these constricted nodules at the tips of each branch. Um, so that's pretty um, distinguishable as to other algaes that you commonly find here. Um, and this is found on Oahu, Molokai, and Big Island. The third algae is leather mudweed. Um, and this algae, the name actually provides a lot of insight into what it looks like. So. These clumps of algae have these leathery um, kind of paddle-like um, branches or like leaves. And um, it's commonly found growing in mud or sand. So the name is really helpful in trying to identify this. Um, and this one is found on Oahu, but it's also found in Kauai mostly. And then hookweed, um, so another one that's name really helps us out. Um, because it grows with these hook-like projections at the end of each branch tip. Um, and this uh, algae is commonly um, red or kind of purpley in color. Um, and this is a prolific algae that's found on all Hawaiian islands. It's pretty uh, common. And the last algae is prickly seaweed. Um, so this grows in thin pointed branches with prickly spines, um, and it usually grows more upright than some of the other algaes um, forming bushy clumps. 
And this is also found on all the Hawaiian islands. It's also pretty prolific. So once we know what we're targeting, um, our first step for managing these algaes is to map the areas. And like I said, because we are only a team of six people, um, mapping and getting density maps of the areas is so important in figuring out where we want to target for future management. So here in this photo, you can see a distribution map of Gracilaria salicornia, or that gorilla ogo that I was talking about earlier. I um, mean, you can see the areas where the most dense algae is occurring is that darker red color. So those are areas where we would target the most with our management tools, and that's where we would focus most of our attention. And like I said, we do have proven management tools um, where we use native collector urchins um, to manage this algae. And I'll leave it at that because it's going to be covered in a later, uh, later presentation. But um, before we can manage anything, we need to know where we are managing. So the main point is that mapping is always before management or um, other decisions that we can make on how to treat that area. And this is where everyone can come in and help out. If you have a smartphone or a camera, um, we have a website called iNaturalist where um, it is free to sign up. It is free to make an account and you can just snap a picture with your smartphone or camera, um, record your observation, um, upload it to the website and share it with other people and you can help identify it or um, ask for identification help. And um, you can even send it to us if you think it's an invasive um, so that we're aware that you found an invasive um, somewhere in the area where you found it. So here's a, an example of an iNaturalist upload that I uploaded um, to our Aquatic Invasive Species Project. So you can see this is Acanthophora, and I took this picture of it when I was snorkeling in um, Waikiki, and I was able to upload it, and it gets upload like uploaded, and the time and date it was submitted, and the time and date that is it was observed is entered into the website. Um, it also, you can use a GPS point, like a lat latitude and longitude point, if you have it, or you can also just use the drag and drop pin option and drop it in the approximate location where you found it. This website also um, indicates if it's an invasive species, so that's what this kind of red exclamation point is for. And you can see when I uploaded it, I um, knew what it was, so I identified it as Acanthophora specifera, and then someone else on the website confirmed that they also thought it was that. Um, and be based on our identification history, our two confirmations and agreement with each other was enough to um, upgrade our observation to a research grade observation. And the cool thing about iNaturalist is once it is upgraded to a research grade grade submission, it gets sent over to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a global species um, database where um, anyone in the world can see where a species is um, found throughout the world. So um, you're not only helping just us if you're uploading, um, you're also helping a global database as well. So if you're attending this con uh, conversation or this presentation and um, you're thinking, I would love to help, but I'm not 100% sure on my species ID. We created an aquatic invasive species guide for you through iNaturalist. Um, so if you do make an account and you go to under the more tab and then guides, um, you'll be able to search state of Hawaii aquatic invasive species and see our guide. And this includes invasive algae as well as other invasive aquatic species. Um, and it provides pictures and information on each that will help you become better at identifying these species. And once you're um, ready to identify the species and upload it to our project um, to let us know where you're finding these invasives, uh, you can search the State of Hawaii Aquatic Invasive Species Project also on iNaturalist 
and you can upload your observation to our project. Um, this is a recent screen cap. You can see that we have so far 371 observations of 41 different species. And so far, 74 different people have um, added to our project, which is really cool. I think that's a pretty broad reach, um, but it's never too late to expand and get more um, observations as well. So also a, a couple years ago, um, we were able to download our iNaturalist data and analyze it. Um, so this is again from a couple years ago, but um, shows the distribution of where we were receiving reports from. So you can see most of our reports are from Oahu, but some are also from some of the other islands as well. And you can see that most of our reports are pretty evenly split between freshwater and marine. Um, but you can see in the right graph that our marine algae uh, um, submissions are a lot lower than some of the other submissions we get. So that's why we're hoping to get some more marine algae um, submissions, but anything that you guys submit will be helpful. And if you're interested um, and you would like to um, create an account and join our project, I created a how-to PDF um, that is uploaded onto our DAR AIS team website. And I think Kim um, is going to post that in the chat for everyone. Um, so if you're interested, you can get the directions on how to um, join online. And hopefully if you guys are excited about joining and contributing, um, this might encourage you even further. Um, so we're actually promoting a HESOM challenge for iNaturalist. Um, so the person that submits the most reports to the state of Hawaii's Aquatic Invasive Species Project on iNaturalist for HESOM, so the month of February, um, will get a DAR AIS t-shirt and some other DAR goodies. So make sure you get your submissions in and to our project. And if you're out um, trying to collect these photos for um, the, this challenge, this AIS challenge, um, and you see something that you think is more emergent and warrants a rapid response, um, you can always feel free to email our DAR AIS email. So our email is dar.ais at hawaii.gov. And um, we would just hope that you would include um, the area that you saw um, this species of concern, a site description of where you found it, um, pictures if you were able to take them, and then some personal contact information, either an email that we can respond to or a phone number um, so that we can get back to you if we have any questions. So there's many routes to reach us um, if you guys need to. And that concludes my talk today. Um, but as I said, these are the two related talks. So if you guys are more interested in finding out some about the native urchin biocontrol of invasive algae, that talk will be on February 17th at 10 a.m. And if you guys are interested in learning more about the ballast water and biofouling um, being the major vector of introduction of aquatic species, that talk is also February 17th, but it's at 2 p.m. So I can take any questions now if anyone has them and wants to put them in the chat or the Q&A tab. Great, thanks Jen. That was a wonderful talk. So if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and post them in the Q&A and or the chat. I have a question while we're waiting. Um, so those major algae that you covered, is there any other invasive algae that's come um, to Hawaii since then, since those five major ones? Yeah, there's a lot of other um, aquatic invasive um, algaes, but um, 
those are the five main ones that we aim to um, manage. Okay, so we have a question in the chat. Um, is a super sucker still in operation? Um, so the super sucker is not still in operation and it's actually a good news kind of situation um, where we have gotten, we use the super sucker um, for people that are unaware of the project um, kind of as um, almost like a lawnmower for um, the invasive algae. So we would hand pull out some of the algae and um, kind of feed it into this vacuum like system that would super suck the algae off the reef. Um, and because recently we've been having such success with how much they have already um, done with the super sucker and then using the urchins on top of that, um, we haven't had um, such an abundance of algae to the point where we would have to utilize the super sucker again. So it's a kind of a success story. <laughs> Great. Um, so I have another question. How long has iNaturalist been being used in Hawaii? Um, maybe that's a question for you, Kim. I, I'm relatively new to our team, um, and Kim's my supervisor, and she was doing <laughs> iNaturalist before I was, so. Um, um, so I think the state of Hawaii has been using it, like the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. We created the project in probably 2017 or 18, um, but iNaturalist has been around as an app for a long time. And actually uh, like the Bishop Museum um, has a big project with um, like just all the biological observations in Hawaii in general. If you go on there and just kind of poke around, you'll find a lot of cool Hawaii based groups too. And I also um, forgot to mention this in my talk, but if you guys are ever out hiking and um, want to know more um, about terrestrial species too, iNaturalist also helps with that too. It's not just aquatic species. So you can use it for um, identifying plants or birds or anything like that. So um, it's a good learning tool. We have a couple more questions. Um, so are the number of observations made in this project available to the public? Yes, yeah, so um, the dashboard picture that I showed that said um, how many observations and how many people have submitted to our project, that's like public access. So if you make a profile and you join our project, you'd be able to see all that data as well. Great. Um, and are Kappa ficus and Yukima only found in Kanyohebe? From what we know about, yes. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah, I would say so. I think that there have been some, some reports from a little bit further north, but um, I don't know that they uh, were correct. And there's def it's definitely not in the same abundance as it is in Kanyohebe. Um, I think someone asked, are there aquatic invasive teams for DAR on every island? Um, and I might be wrong on this, but from what I'm aware of, not solely dedicated to aquatic invasive species. So um, our team is the only team under DAR that strictly handles invasive species. There are teams on other islands that um, their main focus is something else, but they will also address invasive species, but we're the only designated DAR team that handles invasive species. Thank you, Jen, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you all for attending. Uh, thanks, everyone.